All right, we're going to look at um, William Wordsworth's uh, preface to lyrical ballads. And uh, last time we looked at uh, Bruns's essay on Wordsworth and the limit, limits of romantic hermeneutics. And uh, I did talk about Bruns's uh, take on it, which I think is quite provocative and deals with a lot of the themes that I myself like to raise and uh, that's why I used it. Uh, but it occurred to me that, um, and I, I've talked about my own sort of view of what's going on with the, the human nature uh, in terms of being expressed human nature as an organism as opposed to an agent. Uh, so the romantic conception is that of human nature organically connected to the natural world in a sort of a symbiotic relationship, which is, uh, pretty much how modern science perceives it. How does that affect um, artistic considerations is the issue. I mean, I have my own concerns about the anthropology. I think it's problematic on any number of levels. It certainly uh, undermines the notion of personal responsibility because it, it undermines personal agency. It suggests that human beings are not able to act on their environment because the environment is always acting upon them. So they're never uh, free. They have no free will, right? So if you're always being acted upon yourself by the environment, you're, you're stimulated by it and this conditions you. So, you know, I can excuse the murder of somebody by the fact that I had you know, a bad egg for breakfast that made me feel sick and that changed my brain chemistry and whatever. So you can always excuse actions. Uh, and that, that if you have an idea of the organic relationship of a person with, well, it's no longer a person, but the, whatever the human being is with the environment, then that erodes away. And you can see that legally, that is what happens. It also happens politically. So these things to me are obvious. Um, and, uh, and those are part of the big picture, which, I mean, this is a class in lit theory. It's for the purposes of English literature, but I actually do think it's, a, it's more of a study in the humanities. It's a, it's, it's, it does have a bigger scope. Um, but if for the purposes of literature, uh, what's the effect of all this? H how does it affect the writing? Uh, how does it affect our view of the author? How does it affect our view of reading and the audience's response? Uh, those are all issues that were raised from the beginning of the course and that little um, schemata that, uh, uh, who was it that provided it? Was it Fry or was it uh, Abrams? It was Abrams and the sort of the Aristotelian four causes, the four ways of looking at it that I suggested was more Aristotelian uh, how does Wordsworth's views affect that and, and um, other things? Last time I, I said that, uh, or at least Bruns mentioned that in thinking about himself, and we use Tintern Abbey to do express this, Tintern Abbey, by the way, being one of the lyrical ballads, uh, the, the uh, concluding lyrical ballad, in fact. The first one, it was The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, or is it the other way around? No, I don't think so. Um, so two famous poems. Uh, Tintern Abbey, Wordsworth thinks of himself or remembers himself back when he was young and looks upon himself and identifies himself in rela relation to that past identity. And his past identity is not exactly in continuity with his present identity. It has some relation though, but that's how he establishes who he is in relation to himself, not in relation to uh, his, his family or his nation, but it, in or, it's, a, it's a relation to himself, but there are two selves being posited. And I suggested that the human sciences did this in general. So in Freudian psychology, you're, you're, they posit a subconscious, which is a novel suggestion. Is there any evidence for self subconscious? No, not really, but it's a necessary to have something that explains the actions of this person that no longer has agency. There has to be something that determines it. And so Freud posits the subconscious. So you have two selves. So there's no, no longer the person and God. There's the person and then whatever lies within the person that 
explains what this other individual does. So that th there's this, and I, I called it in my uh, doctoral thesis, we're stuck in the position of being self-interpreting orphans. Or, or there's a crisis of self-legitimation because this self that is posited has no substance. It has no history. It has no uh, physical manifestation even. It's sort of like word, Wordsworth's epitaphs. It's a spiritual thing, but it has nothing else besides that. It doesn't have a physical features. It doesn't have agency. It doesn't have a history. It doesn't have parentage, none of those things. And you've heard me say in some classes that from this time onwards, uh, the orphan becomes a sort of hero of, of literary endeavors, and it does to this very day. Orphans are usually the hero at Disney movies, but you, you get it back in, uh, in Dickens novels, you get it in romantic poetry. Uh, it's almost always, and when I say almost always, the exceptions almost prove the rule. It is an individual, an autonomous self, having to create his or her identity. The Bildungsroman. It's a, it's a model of self-education. You're learning who you are by living, but not learning from teachers. And so it's an application of the motto of the Royal Society. Uh, and the application of, to my mind, uh, a scientific approach. Uh, the motto of the Royal so Society, by the way, is nullius in verba, Royal Society, 1688, by the way. Modern science probably begins with the Royal Society. Nullius in verba, take no one's word for it. Not a literal translation, but in no one's words. So you don't take, you don't trust words. And that's because they are, the whole uh, scientific method is predicated on Descartes' system of doubt and Descartes sense of personhood underlies the whole thing as well you read Descartes by now I hope uh, you know his famous cogito ergo sum I think therefore I am but that was the last statement in a, a series of statements which began with the premise of doubt. The cosmology of the medieval period had been overthrown, the Copernican cosmology, which he thought was the, had established all knowledge because astronomy was connected to music and connected to mathematics and connected to geometry. The quadrivium was connected to astronomy. And if astronomy went, then he also had to doubt all the other things that, that were connected to it. And so he had no basis for certainty. So he ascribed a method, and, and his work, Descartes' work is called a discourse on method. It's a methodological pro approach to establish certainty if he couldn't trust the words of others. So this is what Bruns attributes to Luther really belongs to Descartes. Descartes is the source of this problem. Um, and he begins with the method of doubt. And this is how he establishes certainty. I will doubt absolutely everything that I can't be certain of. And then when I get down to the level where I have certainty, then I will build up from that foundation. Well, what does he doubt? He doubts absolutely everything. Because remember, he, he used to be able to trust that the, the sun would rise and the sun would set. But now with the new cosmology, he realizes that's not true. The sun is not moving around the earth. It appears that way, but it isn't that way. We still use the terms, but that's not what's happening because the earth is going around the sun. It appears this way, but it is that way. So I can't trust anything that what I previously thought was certain. So he doubts absolutely everything. Well, what can't he doubt? He can't doubt that he's doubting, right? Because he's doubting, so he knows that he's doubting. Okay, well, if he's doubting, then it means he's thinking. And if he's thinking, he is, right? So it's often presented in this form of the cogito, but actually it's probably better thought of as the dubito. I doubt, therefore I am. But it's the doubting that gives rise to the thinking. But really the modern, modern uh, 
philosophy is rooted in doubt rather than in uh, the Christian tradition in belief. I'm putting it very crassly to draw a dichotomy, but I think there's something to it. That doesn't mean that the belief was blind. It was, it was based on a metaphysical understanding because the ancient world was also highly skeptical of appearances and metaphysics is what saved the appearances. Right? The idea, like Pl Plato's ideas of there being such a thing as justice, goodness, beauty, truth, these things were necessary in order to understand what was going on and they were demonstrable logically. You could use the laws of logic and you could use mathematics and it would hold true in all places at all times and if mathematics didn't work, neither would geometry and if geometry didn't work, you couldn't build anything, it wouldn't stand. And if mathematics didn't work, you wouldn't be able to hear harmony in the musical notes. But all of these things hung together and they were demonstrable. And so there was a truth there and it was, it was, it was implicit in things and it could be discovered and known. And so there was a certainty based on that. But when Descartes doubts all these things, he, he's the one who wipes the sacred page clean. But the sacred page is not the page of scripture, it's this, this, the, this, the page of tradition. All knowledge not just that of the church, and all authorities go with it. And the self that arises out, the sense of human self, has been called, described um, as a ghost in a machine. So the Cartesian notion of human personhood it is a disembodied self. In a, uh, I, gosh, I meant to do this, I was thinking, it, I should do it last time. In a children's encyclopedia in the 1930s, there's a little portrait of a, of a head, it's a brain, and inside the brain there's somebody at a switchboard. And you don't even have a switchboard. It, old telephones used to work, you used to phone the operator and the operator would connect you with somebody. Could you connect me to this person? And the operator would literally take a wire, stick one wire here and then stick it over there and they would connect you. There would literally be a person that was connecting you. And that they would have to do a physical cable connection. And that little switchboard operator, the person at the switchboard connecting the person inside the brain, that was you. So it was the ghost in the machine. There was that idea of the mind inside the brain. And for, Bre for Descartes, there was no, no brain. It was the mind-body problem. That's the problem that's the legacy of Cartesian uh, philosophy, is that there's no way of connecting this thinking substance, the race cogitans, to the body. There's nothing there. And Wordsworth inherits that, and the Romantics inherit that. They perceive it as uh, a problem of, of being alienated. They're alienated from their bodies, and they're alienated from other people, and they're alienated from the cosmos. And they propose to reconnect to it through feeling. That's why the emphasis on feeling and chiefly through the word, through the imagination. And the poetic project is doing just that. But it's an extension of the enlightenment, and I said this last time, because they assume that Descartes is basically right and he just needs to be adjusted a little bit. So it's enlightenment 2.0 is how I put it in using contemporary jargon. It's, it's the same basic operating program. They don't go back to the problem of Descartes' anthropology. They try to fix his anthropology because his anthropology had, after all, led to the Royal Society and the scientific method, which in the natural sciences had been so successful. And now it was going to be applied in the human sciences through romanticism. And that is what my book was about. That but, and the problem with it is they still have this problem of selfhood. How do I legitimate myself when the, the object of my thought is myself and the subject of my thought is myself, but those two selves, are, are they not the same self? And if not, how do they relate to one another? And which one has legitimacy, my old self or my new self? Descartes, or rather Wordsworth in Tintern Abbey seems to think his new self, 
is the living self. He becomes a living soul before he was not. Was he not living? What was he? What exactly was that? He, he needs to, but he, that, that old self when he was a child gives way to the new adult self and the adult self seems superior to the child even though the child is often a hero in romantic writing. The adult is able to imagine what it was like in the past and then work and live forward based on that. Because as a child, you don't think much. You just act. That's how he described it in Tintern Abbey at any rate. He loved nature, but he didn't reflect on it. Whereas an adult, he can reflect on nature and how he was when he was a child. And that distance, the imagination is the vehicle for creativity and, and, and freedom, freedom from himself. It's an emancipatory proclamation. And it's fitting that lyrical bouts are written uh, nine short years after the French Revolution because it is a revolutionary poetics. And with all that said, so that's just the intro to his preface to lyrical ballads because I think that's all helpful and necessary to say by way of preface. But he comes uh, a later, um, uh, he was a Wheaton professor, um, describes the, uh, it's his term, the self-interpreting orphans. Hermeneutics and the Cartesian tradition. Uh, drawing a blank on his name right now. It'll come to me. He's now uh, sadly deceased. No, blank. So my kids kept me up last night, so I'm sort of flying on fumes. Sometimes lectures work better this way, oddly enough. Um, but there are, he tells it the self-interpreting orphan, okay, but the orphan that's interpreting himself, how, do we, how does that orphan attain legitimacy? On what, by what standard? How does, because, because it appears 200 years on that this is just the beginning of postmodernism, right? And there's no, it's, everything's just utterly subjective. How then does this self-interpreting orphan attain in, Emmanuel Kant's eyes and his contemporaries' eyes, universality. How does, e how does it apply to everybody? Well, they assume a common human nature. And they do assume that reason applies to everyone. And for all of the subjective turn, it still is true. They will still use the terms of truth. And Wordsworth and Coleridge and all of these uh, writers, for the most part, I think the second generation is uh, more radical in its interpretation of the romantic project, but they all seem not to be worried about the problem of um, moral relativism or cultural relativism. They seem to think that there's a common human nature. And so if you read the uh, uh, American Declaration of Independence and so forth, concurrent with this roughly, um, it will talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It will talk about uh, the, these, the declaration of the rights of man. Mary Wollstonecraft will add the rights of women, but they seem to think that they are universal. They apply to everyone. There isn't a British human rights and a, a native human rights, or like there are just human rights. So they still are holding on to something of the past. But I think once you've reduced the, the uh, thing that legitimizes it, namely the self, as the only grounds of legitimacy, then you run into problems of, of persuading people that what you are saying is true of everyone is actually true of everyone. So I can assert, if I'm words with this, what if a woman comes along and says, you don't speak on behalf of me. A woman's experience is different than a man's, which eventually feminists will say, there's, a, there's such a thing as women's time I encounter that when I try and get my family ready on a Sunday. Um, and in the classroom, there's such a thing as students' time. It's not quite the same thing as being on time. There's also mass in time, which might not be the same as everybody else's time either. But there's a relative, like, how, is there such a thing as a time to which we all uh, ascribe to? Well, this will break down. 
And so feminists will say that there's a that the woman's experience is different because of their organism is different than a man's. A woman's body differs from a man's body. Next semester we'll see that that the feminist gambit on this falls prey to other women. So the African American experience, the so-called womanist feminists will say to the white elite first wave, second wave feminists, you don't speak for me, you speak on behalf of the privileged aristocratic, you know, you're, you're the Yale, Harvard intellectual of your type, but you don't represent the experience of a black woman in America. How dare you? And what are they going to say? There's some truth in what they're saying. Correct? I mean, they don't in terms of their experience, but they're both appealing to experience. And again, this is a romantic appeal. And the experience is of the orphan, but the orphans don't have the same parent because the parent is their self. They have no common, there's no common humanity anymore. So this is my problem with romanticism and the whole project is it undermines the humanities. There is no common humanity anymore. The, the romantics don't see this is what I'm saying. Kant does not see this. So there's a crisis of self-legitimation. It's as if when you're uh, walking in the sun and with the blazing sun behind you, you see your shadow in front of you. The shadow is an image of yourself, right? And I, I am trying to, you know, I see the shadow. I see it's a relation to myself. But as soon as I try and jump on the shadow, the shadow moves. It's always a moving target. There's no objectivity anymore other than the categories of understanding as Kant displays it. But, the, but those categories don't really have a historical basis. Uh, an embodied basis and the romantics try and plug that gap with feeling so with all that let's go to the preface now these uh, the preface sorry the lyrical ballads are written in uh, 1798 but the preface is written in 1800 sorry my and then it's the second edition it comes out in 1802 and the reason that they were written is because uh, Coleridge uh, asked Wordsworth to write them. So the two men wrote the lyrical ballads together. They met, uh, uh, Coleridge is a few years older. He met the young Wordsworth uh, just coming out of Cambridge. They'd both been at Cambridge. And um, they realized they had a great deal in common, so they decided to write a volume of poetry together. They wrote it and then they, uh, words, Coleridge admired Wordsworth. He thought he was a great man and a great poet, a great mind. And he said, you know what? You have to write this preface. And then Wordsworth wrote the preface. We're going to find when we come to Coleridge's Biographia Literaria, which is written in 1817, that he didn't like the preface and he never liked the preface. And Wordsworth would, and he would become very bitter over this. He said, I didn't want to write the stupid preface to begin with. You said I sh should write it. I wrote it. You didn't like it. And I've written what I've written, and that's the end of it. I'm going to do on Don Cherry. I've said it. It's done, right? I'm not, I'm not going to change it, right? That's enough. And Coleridge insisted that he change it because he was getting it wrong, and further, because he was being implicated because he's being accused of heresy, both of them, in their day. And in, her in this day, heresy was something that could get you uh, removed from official positions and so forth. It was a sort of a social contagion at any rate. Uh, Percy Shelley was thrown out of Oxford for it. To be fair, he wrote a, tr a document called The Necessity of Atheism, sent it to the principal of every Oxford college and to every bishop in England. So that's sort of, sort of asking for it, right? But, you know, throw me out. Okay, well, we'll do that. No, they had to. Wasn't his wife like a Christian? Uh, well, oh, you mean the wife that he left with children to run off with Mary Shelley? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Elope with the young 16-year-old Mary Shelley. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's another issue, but whatever. Um, that's the problem, it, it, is it, it 
it creates this. And it's because the self there does not have a, there's no commonality other than the postulate of autonomy, that we have that in common. Yes, but what unites us aside from that? Because if that's all that we have, then I can agree to disagree with you and you can't contradict me. There's, not, there's no basis for consensus anymore. None. Not natural law. Not the appeal to God. Not appeal to the rights of the common rights of mankind. They declare that they're there, but actually, what if we disagree? In our day, human rights are all the rage. People talk about human rights all the time. What if the Chinese say that's a Western conception and we don't acknowledge it? It's just, it's your culture that says that there are human rights, but we don't think that there are. What's your ground of appeal if they disagree? They've got rid of the idea of we're made in the image of God. We're created by God. They've got rid of that. It's the appeal to autonomy. Well, that, that's not going to work very well at all. The Chinese will say this is despicable. It gets rid of the, the, the common nature of humanity. The, 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 the common good is thrown out with that. Autonomy is a bad thing. And those who see autonomy only in ter freedom in terms of autonomy are going to struggle to defend their position. And they are. But the Christian position is different from this, by the way. But this emerges, and I, in my estimation, it infects uh, Christian thinking as well, the postulate of autonomy. But anyway, the preface here. Um, so I'm just going to read from the beginning here, and I'll, I'll, I'll skip around a little bit. But the first volume of these poems, writes Worth, has already been submitted to general perusal. It was published as an experiment, which I hoped might be of some use to ascertain how far by fitting to metrical arrangement a selection of the real language of men in a state of vivid sensation. That sort of pleasure and that quantity of pleasure might be imparted, which a poet may rationally endeavor to impart. Now, isn't that interesting, all those words? First of all, he's using metrical language as poetry. He still regards, and Coleridge will agree with him, and this historically has been the definition of poetry, and it's probably the most basic one. Poetry is metrical language. The only problem with this is the Bible doesn't, in its poetry, doesn't use metrical language. For which reason, in the uh, 18th century, uh, it was accounted to be particularly sublime. Because metrical language is rationally ordered language, and this is transcends rational, and yet it has the emotional appeal. It's deep, it's earthly, it's subliminal, it's utterly appealing, and it, gets, it, it retains its power even when it's translated. So there's something about the holy scriptures which are themselves sublime, which Wordsworth will agree with. But he says how far, and he's going to write in metrical arrangement, and he calls it the real language of men in a state of vivid sensation and what sort of pleasure. So there's going to be a teaching function. He's going to, that's his project. It's an experiment, just like the uh, scientific experiment. And it is going to use meter, and it is going to teach, but it will be in a state of vivid sensation. So it's the purpose of, and a sort of pleasure. So delighting is still a part of the whole project. So in that sense, he retains much of the original uh, language and vocabulary of, uh, around poetry. Uh, I'll skip a few uh, paragraphs down. And uh, he'll say, it says, several of my friends are anxious for the success of these poems from a belief that if the views with which they were composed were indeed realized, a class of poetry would be produced well adapted to interest mankind permanently and not unimportant in the multiplicity and, the, and in the quality of its moral relations. And on this account, they have advised me to prefix prefix a systematic defense of the theory upon which the poems were written. But I was unwilling to undertake the task because I know that on this occasion, the reader would look coldly upon my arguments, since I might be suspected of having been principally influenced by the selfish and foolish hope 
of reasoning him into an approbation of these particular poems. Okay. And then we'll go on to adequately to display my opinions after my to write a much larger treatise. And I just don't, I want to preface. I don't want uh, the poems I want to be the focus. I don't write a, want to write a, a novel. But note that he doesn't want to reason the reader into approving. Like, what's with that? Why would you not want to make an argument? What's with that? This is the uh, common, commonly observed romantic suspicion of rash, rationality. Because he wants the reader to feel the correctness. And the feeling of correctness has more legitimacy than the reasoning process. Because they, they perceive at this point the divisions that have been caused by rationality. It led to the French Revolution. And the French Revolution was legitimate because it was an uprising of the common people against the authorities who had crushed them by using the mechanisms of the state for imposing their power. And they rationalized it. They said, it's, it's right that we do it. It's for the common good. But he doesn't want to reason them into this viewpoint. But note that he says that if they do this, it will be a interest to mankind permanently. So this isn't just an experiment. This is a new, you know, this will be a fashionable endeavor. It's a permanent project. It's real poetry now. It is, and he's going to claim that, in fact. So don't make a mistake that this is just a little experiment and that, um, is just having fun. He, th he has a sense of um, divine vocation here. He's going to cre create a new class of poetry which is superior to that of the Christian era, and chiefly Mr. Milton. And it, when I do the uh, romantic epic, I think I'll teach it next year. We haven't talked about it in-house, but um, we will see that uh, the romantics are all responding to Milton as a man and as a poet, and particularly his poetics. And they think that their poetics are superior to Milton's because the grand march of the intellect has moved us onwards from Christianity to a more universal poetics. Because Christianity is related to those who are Christians, whereas this is all-inclusive. That's the claim. Yes. When you mentioned romantic epics, what, like, what are you like? What works for you? Well, I look at the. I look. I mean, it's. It could be any number of them. Um, like but the, like the ones that you think are like I look at Blake, uh, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley, Byron, and Wordsworth, and I do at least one, if not two, works from all of the authors. So Wordsworth, we look at uh, the Prelude. Uh, Blake, we look at. The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Uh, we look at Milton, his poem. Uh, Shelley, we look at, uh, what do we look at? Prometheus Unbound. Uh, Keats, we look at uh, Hyper the Hyperion poems. Uh, Byron, we look at Cain, uh, an epic. Um, I think I mentioned all of them, and no, I probably didn't. Coleridge, we look at a um, uh, Christabel, a poem. So not all epics, but they're relating to the epic in some way, the themes and basic ideas. So they're all engaging with grand Miltonic themes, and yet they claim to be exceeding them in a way because they're more universal, more inclusive, less uh, dogmatic, and less rooted in um, a provincial way of looking at things. So there's a claim of a greater, more inclusive, sweeping scope on the basis of, a, of a, an organic notion of human nature, because we're all human in the organic sense, and then we're related to the created order, or nature, to use their phrase, rather than the created order, in the same organic sense, because we all breathe the same air and drink the same water and enjoy the same earth, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's a claim of a greater universality. And therefore, it will be permanent, because you can't get bigger than that. So they really see it as a project that is marked by uh, a grand endeavor.
I'm going to skip a few paragraphs down. And uh, the lines, the principal object then, which I proposed to myself in these poems, was to make the incidents of common life interesting by tracing in them, truly though not ostentatiously, the primary laws of our nature. The nature of our nature. Chiefly as far as regards the matter in which we associate ideas in a state of excitement. Low and rustic life was generally chosen because in that situation, the essential passions of the heart find a better soil in which they can attain their maturity, are less under restraint, and speak a plainer and more emphatic language. Because in that situation, our elementary feelings exist in a state of greater simplicity and consequently may be more accurately contemplated and more forcibly communicated because the manners of rural life germinate from these elementary feelings and from the necessary character of rural occupations are more easily comprehended and are more durable. And lastly, because in that situation, the passions of men are incorporated with the beautiful and permanent forms of nature. The language, too, of these men is adopted, purified indeed from what appear to be its real defects, from all lasting and rational causes of dislike or disgust, because such men hourly communicate with the best objects from which the best part of language is originally derived. And because from their rank in society and the sameness and narrowness of their intercourse, being less under the action of social vanity, they convey their feelings and notions in simple and unelaborated expressions. Accordingly, such a language rising out of repeated experience and regular feelings is a more permanent and a far more philosophical language than that which is frequently substituted for it by poets who think they're conferring honor upon themselves and their art in proportion as they separate themselves from the sympathy of men and indulge in arbitrary and capricious habits of expression in order to furnish food for the fickle tastes and fickle appetites of their own creation. Okay, so... Yeah, the, the, the uh, syntax is challenging. He writes in long sentences. He thinks in long sentences. That's okay. In terms of prose style, don't write like this. Vary your sentence length. If you want to emphasize something, put it in a short sentence, I'd suggest. There's nothing wrong with long thoughts. You may require a long thought in order to connect a variety of things. Note that he uses the... Uh, more of the classical um, sense of uh, constructing his ideas than in what we would now call the modern paragraph, right? If remember from practical criticism, he, he's connecting through something like semicola, different ideas, but all connected by a common thread. So it's complicating them and there are a varieties of parallels being drawn there. And it's, when you read it out loud, you can understand it. When you're reading it silently, that's hard to follow, right? But what, what's the gist of it here? The gist of it is that those who are in the present, uh, those who are in a rustic life are a better soil to cultivate a better language. Why? Because they're nearer to nature. And therefore they're nearer to their origins. This all begs the question, what, is, what are human origins? If you have an uh, organic view of human life, our origins are nature. If we have an idea of human agency, what does agency look like? By, on, uh, what's the ground of comparison? Well, in the classical world, the agency is that of the gods, anthropomorphized deities, right? There's a whole variety of them. They're polytheists, but they all have something like personal agency. In Christian understanding, an agent bears the image of God. God's also a person. Right? So the origin of our idea of our, our own nature is related to the nature of the gods. In romantic thinking, the origin is not in uh, reflection of that sense of agency or personhood. It's, it's in its roots in nature. So this is, by the way, this is the grounding of Darwinist understandings of human origins. Origin of the species cannot exist without romanticism. In fact, it is a product of romanticism. 
But I make that case in a different lecture. You can find it online there. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, but it's on my YouTube channel. Um, can't remember what it is. Um, but, the, but the theory of evolution precedes in the, is in the poets long before it's in the scientists' mouths, which makes me think that it's not a scientific theory at all. It is a poetic conception that then gets written down as if it were a biological observation. But anyway, uh, it's, in, it's in the origins of nature. Well, what's the context, the broader context here? Well, uh, if you look back into the earlier 18th century, there's a German writer by the name of Herder, who is simply following Rousseau, both of them who are positing that language originates in grunts and cries, primal cries by um, mankind incapable of articulate discourse, of logic. But this is, this is evocative, powerful, poetic, fundamentally. And so, and, and the, the German writers will all follow Rousseau in this. So as, as I said to you, uh, a few classes ago, English cla neoclassicism in the early 18th century is rooted in the French classicism, which is rooted in reflections on Roman civilization, whereas the German classicism is rooted in Greek classicism, which is rooted in not in the classical age per se so much as in a pre-civilized age, a natural age. It's about being, and, and again, it's sort of the quarrel of the ancients and the moderns. What is so good about the ancients is that they're closer to nature. That's why their poetry is better. That's why their art's better. That's why their, their thinking is clear, that it's more natural. It's not cluttered by civilized discourse, which is making a mess of things. All sorts of distinctions that are complex and complicating and confusing. So Wordsworth, by getting closer to nature and his poetics, is following this same template whether he realizes it explicitly or not. Coleridge will long, not long after this go to Germany, learn German and bring German theology into the English speaking world. But that's after this, this is 1805 or thereabouts for Coleridge. And the German influence on English literary life and culture doesn't really take off until you know, 1850 or so forth with Carlyle. In this day, the Germans are regarded as obscure maybe because they are, but they definitely are regarded that way at this time. But going to the origins of language, so the origins of language are in grunts and cries in the same way that animals make noises. And then only as time progresses that we move away from that. And, and Her, uh, so Rousseau and Herder, Rousseau in particular wants to go back to nature. He regards society as, a, as an oppression on himself. He finds himself oppressed by society. Rousseau's observation is the beginning of modern sociology. They posit the same thing. There's the individual and there's society, and society oppresses the individual because the natural inclinations of, of the autonomous self are at odds with the social compulsions to capitulate. And which is more correct? For Rousseau, it's obvious. The one that's closer to our true nature, which is in our feelings. Our feelings were the first language. It's the basis of language, feelings. So if romantic poetics wants to get to do true poetry, more universal for all human beings, we're going to get closer to nature. So we will set, the setting will be in rural settings. It will be away from cities. Wordsworth could be described as a sociopath if that were not too pejorative because, I mean, I, I think he was a, probably an enormously uh, cultured man and I'm, I'm sure he wasn't a sociopath in the negative sense that we use it now, but he, he had a phobia of society. He thought men in cities, he's going to, I'm going to come to this not, not long after this, he'll talk about how cities uh, impose a sort of um, artificial order on all things and it crushes human, the cr human spirit. 
and therefore the poetic project that Wordsworth is introducing is meant to humanize humanity again. So it almost has a theological motivation. In fact, I think it does, and it was received that way, by the way. So men, uh, young, and that's, or at least according to their own testimony, uh, Coleridge in particular, the young men of Cambridge, Oxford, whatever, they loved this poetry. They thought it was really recovering something that was lost. The sense of our obligation to our fellow creatures, the love of humanity, a genuine sympathy between individuals, which w lay deeper than superficial things. It was a feeling within the commonality between all people. But I'll go on with that. But, but oh, further, the best objects, oh, I haven't got to that yet. No, I have. The best objects of the best part of language is the subject of poetry. Well, what is that? Well, he says that it's rustic life. Coleridge will come to Coleridge's response. He will rebut him point by point on all of these things. Literally point by point. It's, it's delightful and embarrassing because it's the woodshed treatment. You'll say, this is not, well, I'll come to his, let me go through uh, Wordsworth first. But he says, uh, so he's going to, the, the, the subject matter is, is uh, common life. Well, think about historical subject matter for poetic endeavor. Who, who is the subject of the great poems? A great man, an Odysseus, an Achilles, an Aeneas, or a, a knight, or an aristocrat, a certain privileged member of society. Whereas Wordsworth, remember writing in the light of the French Revolution, is going to be writing about the common man and not even the common man, more often a child or a woman or a mad person or a, or a beggar or a vagrant, somebody who's been ostracized, marginalized. In Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, that will be the Arab. This is the beginning of a recalibration of the understanding of the Christian to the Muslim world. In the romantic understanding, the Muslim world has been terribly misunderstood by the rational Western Europe. It's a pretty odd reading of the Crusades. It's common to this very day. Sympathies towards the Muslim world uh, are because we're the oppressors. It's not a very good reading of history because <laughs> Islam spread by, by the sword, always has. But that's not the romantic take on it because they, remember, were even in this day regarded as relatively barbaric. Closer to nature though, less civilized, but that is a, that in, in previous eras, that would be a pejorative. For the romantic, it's a sign of their greater connection to nature. Same with the North American natives or South American or the Africans. We, we think that they're superior because they're less civilized, because civilization is a mark of decay. So Friedrich Schiller in his, who's one of the great uh, writers along with Goethe in the German tradition, We'll write, uh, we'll write on the naive and sentimental in poetry. And he's describing the same, these same polarities of, of the natural and the civilized. And German, German classicism has something of the character of uh, English Romanticism, although there are ambiguities. By the way, the word romantic is not, was never used by the Romantics to further complicate things. It's a later description, but that's another, uh, I won't get off track on that. Um, but let me come to his uh, definition of poetry. 
I'll just read uh, the whole paragraph. I cannot be insensible of the present outcry against the triviality and meanness, both of thought and language, which some of my contemporaries have occasionally introduced into their metrical compositions. And I acknowledge that this defect, where it exists, is more dishonorable to the writer's own character than false refinement or arbitrary innovation. Though I should contend at the same time that it is far less pernicious in the sum of its consequences. From such verses, the poems in these volumes, his own, will be found distinguished at least by one mark of difference, that each of them has a worthy purpose. Not that I mean to say that I always began to write with a distinct purpose formally conceived, but I believe that my habits of meditation have so formed my feelings as that my descriptions of such objects are as strongly excite those feelings will be found to carry along with, with them a purpose. Note he doesn't have a purpose in writing his poems. Like, what? What? Why not? Why wouldn't you have a, po a purpose? How come? Why is he wanting to get rid of the language of, of intent and purpose? Because it doesn't fit with organic sensibilities. It would be rationally imposing an idea of consequence and he's bringing in a new sense, a new sensibility, a new human nature. That's my gist on it. But the feeling will have a sense of purpose, or as Kant described it, purposiveness without purpose. So there's a sense of a purpose, even though it doesn't have a purpose, but he's going to avoid all the language of accountability or intention. The feelings bring it on. It, it's nature that speaks through him as if he were a conduit for it. But he said, and he says, if in this po opinion I am mistaken, I can have little right to the name of a poet. Okay. Now he's the, it's not only saying here's how he sees it, but here's how all poets operate. They never have a purpose. Did Milton have a purpose in writing Paradise Lost? To justify the ways of gods to men? Did uh, Virgil have a purpose in writing the Aeneid? For Wordsworth, as the, the very purpose set out and stated as intentional, that aspect of the poet, poetry was not poetic. It was rationalistic. It was argumentative. But here comes his definition. So if he doesn't, if he has a purpose, then he doesn't deserve the name of a poet. For all good poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. I'll just stop it there and I'll write this down. You've probably heard me on this before. Some of you definitely have because you've had me in classes on romanticism. But all good poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. There's his definition. That's what poetry, in fact, it's not just all poetry. It's all good poetry. Why is it spontaneous and an overflow? Because it doesn't have a preconceived purpose. It just arises. It's purpose, uh, to use Kant's language, it's purposiveness without purpose. It clearly has an effect, but it's not intended by the author because the author would then be an agent. And to be an agent would beg beg the question of what are the terms by which the standard by which we are to judge agency. But he's appealing to organic sensibilities and organic sensibilities are this sort of emotional efflorescence. What's wrong with the definition of poetry, by the way, aside from the human agency thing that I put out here? I, if you've heard me on this before, don't answer. I'm asking the rest of the class. What's the wrong with the definition of poetry? You never guess it. If you've heard me, then you've heard me say it, but otherwise it doesn't, doesn't jump out at you. Yes? I haven't heard you say it. Well, then you're not going to guess it, but go on. I would say, like he's, he's saying poetry is feeling. Like oh, you are. There you go. You got it. Bingo. It's not the, it's not the linguistic depiction of feelings. It is the feelings. Mm 
when I, when, I, when I feel I'm actually being poetic. You're being very poetic. Now, you may say, that's ridiculous. That's not what he means. Well, that's what he says. And I will add, when you look at his poetics, that is the direction that the poetry uh, goes. And it's true of all poetry following the romantics. It's really about the feelings of the author, not the words of the author. And there's an assumption that the feelings of the author, uh, if they are universal and natural enough, will reflect your feelings as well. And for this reason also, and when we come to postmodern literary theories and so forth, why people will demand inclusion in the canon because their feelings ought to be able to be recognized as legitimate as well. And their feelings just happen to disagree with the consensus. And that is a more romantic thing than anything else because the romantics always represented the ostracized and the marginalized. And it's their nature. They're just articulating it, self-identifying it. And as is their right because they're autonomous. But that's it, you've got it right. It's, it's the fact that the poetry is the feelings. Now the language, of course, it's written in language. And, but when you look at Wordsworth's poetry, what lies the power in his poetry is when the poetry breaks down. It's the silences in the poetry. It's the gaps, the long dashes, the pauses. That's really what he's getting you to reflect on. So when he described in Turn Turn Abbey the, the, the silence of the smoke going up in the trees, you say, what? okay, the silent smoke. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. What, so what sound does smoke usually make? No, it makes no sound. The smoke <laughs> makes no sound. The thing making the smoke might. I mean, if you're puffing this, you know, taking a cigarette and blowing it out, well, you're sure you're air. But the smoke makes no sound. So why are you drawing attention to something that it's, it's redundant? It's a redundant term. Yeah, but it makes you think about it. And, it's, and that's the point. You're thinking about what lies the, in the natural object, which you can't perceive and you can't even name. But now you're identifying your soul, your psyche is being drawn to that very thing yourself is identifying with that other thing which also can't be seen but which is there it's a presence and you feel it and he says that all good poetry is this Coleridge is going to note this is just flat wrong it might be true of Wordsworth's poetry it's certainly not true of all poetry let alone all good poetry Wordsworth uh, speaks like a religious zealot on this, and that's fine. That's part of his power. Co Coleridge is more measured and said, is this actually true? And the answer is no, it's flatly not true. Was Milton not a poet? Was Shakespeare not a poet? <laughs> you know, Virgil, Homer, like none of them poets because they clearly are not only writing about these things. Even Longinus, when he's talking about the sublime, he's not just talking about spontaneous, he's talking about the poetic effect of the ordering of certain words. It has an effect on the audience, but it's not the words or the feeling of the author that you're identifying with, it's the effect of the words on you. But again, this is about the spirit rather than the word. Now this animus against the word is deeply embedded in romanticism. I'm gonna talk about it more when I get to speak in chapel. And the Bible and uh, as opposed to your cell phones and I'll let loose but uh, but for here but all of this and uh, although this be true poems to which any value can be attached were never produced on any variety of subjects but by a man who being possessed of more than usual organic sensibility had also thought long and deeply so he doesn't dismiss thought but it's thinking about feelings just like he did in Tintern Abbey So now it's really about the divine character of the poet, the superiority. Although he's a common man and in touch with common men, he has a greater capacity than the, the ordinary man. He represents the common man and yet he uh, uh, and speaks on behalf of the common man and then he becomes a sort of a, a thought leader, as the phrase is these days, which I don't like, although I use it. Uh, but he says that this is, is cultivated 
uh, by uh, involuntary depiction. Once again, involuntary. This, there's no willfulness. It just, nature speaks. Nature as this divine being. He goes on to say, I have said that each of these poems has a purpose. I have also informed my reader that what this purpose will be found principally to be, namely to illustrate the manner in which our feelings and our ideas are associated in a state of excitement. But speaking in less general language is to follow the fluxes and refluxes of the mind when agitated by the great and simple affections of our, of our nature. And then he goes on to talk about some of those poems. What are the poems? And this will illustrate what I said earlier. What are the names of the poems? The Idiot Boy. Idiot doesn't mean stupid, by the way. It, it's, uh, it's, it's, an idiot is from, uh, from the uh, Greek. Uh, idios is that pertaining only to himself. Uh, an idiot savant in the, day, in, uh, in the language of the day, it was used up until the 70s, now it's verboten, you can't call anyone an idiot, is somebody who only knows himself. It's, uh, what would we call this now? Hmm? No, no, not a character trait. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, Trumpian? Sorry? Trumpian. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, it would be, um, I can't remember. Anyway, he's caught up in his own world and doesn't seem to be able to relate to anyone else. The idiot boy, the mad mother, the forsaken Indian. We are seven. We are seven is a poem about a child who's lost her siblings and they're buried underneath the ground. So it's somebody who's been bereft of, of children and mothers. So it's an orphan. The brothers, Simon Lee, an old man traveling, the two thieves. So they're, they're outcasts in whatever way. They've been ostracized or alienated by circumstances. These are the subjects of his poetry, not aristocrats. So when he says the common man, he doesn't mean the common man is in common experience. These are in some ways uncommon experiences. They're pitiable states. And he does take pity on them. And he, the way he pities them is by highlighting their experiences as exemplary. And why does he do this? And there's a context. He says, now this is a whole page on, a multitude of causes unknown to former times are now acting with a combined force to blunt the discriminating powers of the mind and unfitting it for all voluntary exertion to reduce it to a state of almost savage torpor. The most effective of these causes are the great national events which are daily taking place and the increasing accumulation of men in cities where the uniformity of their occupations produces a craving for extraordinary incident which the rapid communication of intelligence hourly gratifies. He's talking about city urban life, 24 hour news cycle, uniform occupations, people wear uniforms. He's talking about the origins of the nation state. Huge throwing together of people into grand cities and a reduction of the allowance for individual differences. They're being required to get up at the same time, go to bed at the same time. The lights will force people, will allow that to happen, in fact. You don't go to sleep when it gets dark. You go to sleep at a time. You can stay up till 11 o'clock at night. Why? Electric light allows you to do so. We wouldn't have done that in the past. Right, so there's a, now there's a rational uh, imposition of society on human nature even, and he says that it, dis, it, it actually blunts uh, humanity in some ways. It, it alienates us, and cities are terrible for this. So therefore, uh, I'm gonna use rural landscapes where people are closer to the soil. They're less fooled by life. I actually think there's some truth to that, having said that. People who watch how animals 
act on their farms are not quite so fooled by things the way city people are. City people believe what they read in the papers. How, how stupid can you be? Like, and it's the news, and that's what he says. Because they're, they're, their life is so tedious and repetitive and disconnected from nature, they, they, they long for the news they, because that's new. Everything else is tedious, routine, dull, disconnected. And the effect of this to, to this tendency of life and manners, the literature and theatrical exhi exhibitions of the country have conformed themselves. The invaluable works of our elder writers, I'd almost said the sh works of Shakespeare and Milton, are driven into neglect by frantic novels, sickly and stupid German tragedies, and deluges of idle and extravagant stories in verse. Horror fiction, the Gothic novel, He's probably thinking about this sort of thing. Like good literature is being drowned out by sensational horror type stuff. This is awful. When I think upon this degrading thirst after outrageous stimulation, I am almost ashamed to have spoken of the feeble effort with which I have endeavored to counteract it. He's talking about reality television of his day, the equivalent. So it's there simply to sensationalize and people eat it up. So he sees it as a moral project to bring people back to a more humane uh, order. But he believes in the in inherent and indestructible qualities of the human mind. And likewise of certain powers in the great and permanent objects that act upon it which are equally inherent and indestructible. So he believes in the, in the, uh, the mind's comportment with nature. So it is a sort of appeal back to natural law. But the natural law is not of natural agency, it's now of an organic sensibility. And that there's a just, a, it's a wide gulf. I have not yet read anybody else who talks about this the way I, I, I'm talking about it. I think this is the key point. It's, it's an anthropological shift. Yes? My question to Wordsworth would be, is like for those people that he's studying, like. And like the, the Enlightenment and the moderns, they were saying that we have, we have gone out of this chaotic civilization and we're now at modernity because we don't want to be like savages and those kinds of people. Why is he saying that don't, like, isn't he kind of counteracting, the, going against what the Enlightenment people are saying? Well, the Enlightenment people are divided, right? The ancients and the moderns are both Enlightenment. They're the French. Academy and some of them regard the ancients as our artistic superiors and if we want the best the best of everything we go to the ancients the moderns just say no it's not so and they're the general grounds of appeal is look at modern science we do things and know things that they never knew so we have ever everything that they had we do just as well and we have far more like our view of modern science is far superior and, f and, and our arts are based on a correct view of the way the natural world is. So of course our art, our art is also superior. So say the moderns. Um, but again, that's in the French Academy. That's not quite the same as this. This is a later development. This is in the, this is a, like that is the French Academy that's late 17th century. Now we're in the uh, late 18th century and a lot happens in that period including the French Revolution. But that's a decisive event. And the, and the subjective turn, Kant's philosophy uh, and Burke, as I say, there are big shifts. I, I said this with Burke. The sublime and the beautiful were, were degrees. So there's, there's a beautiful thing, there's a more beautiful and the most beautiful, and the most beautiful is the sublime. But there's a continuum there. You get to Burke and he totally separates them. And Kant agrees with him on that. These are different sensations from different purposes, and then Kant gives the subjective turn on it. Likewise, these are not small shifts. These are big, big changes, and the consequences are, are in the poetic. So in a way, they're in dialogue with the previous writers, but in a way, they're talking at cross purposes. They don't even acknowledge the same category. So Wordsworth, er in his arrogance or in his misreading, thinks that all poetry at all ages and all times works the way his poetry does. 
Kohler says, this is just nonsense. It's just simply, it's just, you fail the exam. You get a zero. It's just flat wrong. It might be true of your own poetry, and your own poetry might be very valuable. But it, it, you cannot say that all good poetry has always operated this way. It simply doesn't. And it hasn't been in conjunction with nature. Coleridge's point is that if that's the case, then why are we not reading the Shakespeare of Africa or the Shakespeare of North America? Because their nature's far superior to ours. It's more beautiful. It's, got, it's more sublime. Like think of a desert or an, um, like the, look, at, look at the natural world in North America. Then their poetry ought to be equally bad if it comes from nature. But this is simply not so. And then he, Coleridge directs it in a different direction. But he just, the argument's terrible. It's not, it can't be, it, this cannot be the explanation. Nonetheless, there is a moral revolt that Coleridge is in agreement with. There's something, a debasement of sensibilities in the Enlightenment that he thinks the Romantics are addressing. Now I'm taking you all over the place. I'm going back to the Enlightenment. I'm going forward to the contemporary. I realize, I hope that's not too confusing, but I, I just, the connections are, are helpful. Uh, but he rules out traditional poetic diction. He decides he's going to cut it out. It has been necessary to cut me off from a large portion of phrases and figures of speech, which from father to son have long been regarded as the common inheritance of poets. He's thrown out poetic vocabulary. So it is a rejection of the tradition of poetry. And the mimesis was the basis of poetics before. It was a dialogue with the past. Not, this is not to say you can't read the romantics that way, but it does really try and put, a, uh, put the ax to the root. And let's get to real poetry. And the claim is that it's always been true of all good poetry, but then the whole of Paradise Lost is not good poetry. There are little, little sections that are good poetry little sections of Homer that are good poetry, but not the whole poem, because the whole poem does not fit with this idea of a spontaneous overflow of powerful feeling, and that's what it is. And when we come to Percy Shelley and his defense of po poesy, speaking to Spencer, same title roughly, he's going to claim that not only is this true of what we call poetry, but also of religion and also of jurisprudence, like all the great figures throughout human history were poets. Moses was a poet. Jesus was a poet. Plato was a poet. Solon, the lawgiver of, of uh, Sparta, was a poet. They're all poets. And say, well, now you've broken down the boundaries of, like, what? so it's just a, a, a grand thought, an original idea, a powerful expression. This is now poetry. Well, that's more or less what Wordsworth's saying. Shelley's just continuing on with that, but he now breaks the boundaries between poetry and other types of discourse. Um, I think that's what, and, and he will in fact question it here himself. Uh, I'll, I'll just read on you. I don't know where it is in your section here. He says, um, it would be a most easy task to prove to him that not only the language of a large portion of every good poem, even of the most elevated character, must necessarily, except with reference to the meter, in no respect differ from that of good prose, but likewise that some of the most interesting parts of the best poems will be found to be strictly the language of prose, when prose is well written. So good poetry is no longer even bound by meter. Okay, sure, meter is the, what makes poetry poetry. But the commonality, the real poetry, it, which is the spontaneous overflow, that's in all language. So he's really, and he says, the truth of this assertion might be demonstrated by innumerable passages from almost all the poetic writings, even of Milton himself. And then he'll go on and talk about the character of the poet, and I'm not going to be able to get to that, but he talks about what is a poet, and basically he is an apt, uh, to summarize, he is an active empathist. Like I said last time, he casts his feelings into the feelings of another person because after all, that is what good poetry is even. It's his overflow of powerful feelings that are feeling somebody else's feelings. And most people would tell me that that's what poetry is anyway, it's feeling. Then what's the need for metrical language? Do you have feelings in meter? I think the meter can get 
discarded. It does get discarded after Wordsworth. It's an impediment to true feeling. Anyway, so that's the, that's the general gist. Uh, next time we'll pick it up and look at Coleridge's response to it.